You are listening to the podcast When Life Gives You Lemons, presented by me, Emma Levy. Having worked with elite athletes for most of my career, it's always intrigued me that a significant number of high-performing individuals have encountered some form of adversity earlier in their lifetime. My fascination into this grew when I had my own brush with adversity when I was diagnosed with breast cancer in May 2020, in the midst of the global pandemic at the age of only 36. During this period, I questioned whether it was my positive mindset or maybe something deeper, which enabled me to bounce back and to train and compete for a triathlon just one month following completion of all active cancer treatment. The goal of this podcast is to explore this concept further by meeting a variety of high-performing individuals who have experienced adversity, but who have come back stronger. Today, I'm welcoming Ellie Simmons to the podcast. Ellie Simmons, OBE, is a former Paralympic British swimmer. In 2008, at the young age of only 13, she won two gold medals at the Beijing Paralympic Games. Four years later, in her home games in London, she won another two gold medals and set a world record time. She wasn't finished though, because then in 2016 at the Rio Paralympic Games, she won another gold medal, setting her second world record in the pool. Not only is Ellie a swimming legend, but since retiring from sport last year, she has forged a successful career in the media, making documentaries, broadcasting on major sporting events, dancing on BBC Strictly Come Dancing, and she is also an advocate for representation across disability. Ellie is one busy lady, so I'm so grateful she's here to talk to us today. Hello, Ellie. Hi, Emma. Oh, thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to chatting. I know that we've worked a lot leading into Tokyo, my my last Paralympics and the physio and side. So yeah, it's really nice to still continue chatting to you. Oh, thanks so much, Ellie. You, you have achieved so much at such a young age. And in fact, I read that you were the youngest person to ever receive an MBE which I didn't know, which is unbelievable. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think, um, so like you said, um, when you get given my bit of information about me, so yeah, after Beijing, um, my first Paralympic Games, I was 13, going to Beijing, going to China, my first Games, and just thinking, oh, this is an amazing summer holiday, never thinking I'd come away um, with two gold medals. We'd planned as a team, a, a British swimming team, to, to go to Beijing just with the experience, just, again, with the focus being four years later of London 2012. Um, yeah, so to come away from those games, two gold medals was very shocking, not just for myself, but my from my coach, Billy, to the whole British swimming team, to the whole nation. But And then, like you said, like I came home and had some media opportunities and some really, really good things. But then pl- on the plus side, getting that letter through the post from the Her Royal Majesty, the Queen, saying... Yep. Well, actually, I opened it, first of all, um, and was like, oh, mum, what's this letter? Like, it's an MBA. And I was like, I, to be honest, I was very naive 13-year-old. I didn't have a clue at all what um, an MBA or any of the member, um, the honours from the, 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 the Her Majesty were, to be to be fair. And, yeah, so I was very blasé about it. I was like, oh, here's a letter, you know. And then when my mum read it through and explained it, we were just, like, gobsmacked and shocked and just yet overwhelmed and to have that whole experience but also be awarded for what from the the queen and the great britain and stuff from something that i just love to do which is swimming and yeah that um i think it was that january actually january february time um of 20 of 2009 so yeah i'd had my 14th birthday so my birthday is in november um, I was yeah got to go to the Queen got well sorry got to go to Buckingham Palace wow. and to see the Queen and yeah bring my family along my mom my dad and also my grandma as well at the time she she's the same age as the Queen oh. um so for her like growing up with seeing um the Queen and um Buckingham Palace never thinking that she'll actually get to go and experience it so yeah bringing her was definitely a heartfelt moment oh, but yeah to to be rewarded was just incredible and to have that honour to my name and then after London 2012 an OBE but yeah I think to have the youngest person ever 
still that record I think actually yeah it's quite think it a, is. yeah it's quite a nice little an achievement definitely oh, I think I like doing things young yeah. with bathing <laughs> and then feel like everything I do is set in that like young young exactly. age but it shows you can do anything no matter what age exact age is just a number um oh yeah exactly <laughs> so all of those those unbelievable achievements I I talked about in the, in the introduction do you have a specific highlight for me, I've got to say, my highlight was the London 2012 um, Paralympics. I think what that, those games did for Paralympic sport was step it up. You know, Paralympians were seen as professional athletes. I think like before, um, like I remember I was got inspired by watching Athens 2004 Paralympics. And that's as an eight, nine year old sitting on the sofa. That was when my life changed and mm. dream became a dream of wanting to go to the Paralympics and get a gold medal and then to think, yeah, Beijing, I think the media definitely was getting more and more attached to the Paralympics. But then, like I said, London 2012 just did that next step and it changed the perception of not just Paralympic sport, but disability sport in in general and not just in the United Kingdom as well, but the whole world, you know, it definitely stepped it up. And I think for me, from the, the whole journey from Beijing coming back from those games and in a way the public and the British media and companies and sponsors were focusing on those British athletes those home athletes and for me going into London 2012 was just yeah maybe I must say yeah I was probably one of the faces one of the poster girls of those games with some other incredible British athletes but the whole countdown was from from Beijing was that four years you know London 2012 and so the opportunities that I got going into those games but it was amazing but also the pressure as well was mm. was added on going into those games because yeah. I was gonna I was gonna like say to you the... actually I, I do I remember you being a poster girl and you were you know you were only 16 17 you must be 17 years old mm-hmm. and you, yeah, yeah. you were one of the poster girls of the Paralympic Games you know it was your home games so it must have been an amazing privilege but also a massive pressure and as such a young child really how did you deal with that pressure going into the games and yeah exactly that I think there was a lot of pressure on my shoulders you know going out in the public and people were like you're getting that gold medal already they had that like they thought I got the gold already even before I raced and we know as athletes that it's not just about the finals but you've got the heat you've just got to get there you know you've got to be in tip-top form body and best position best best position position um and yes there's a lot of pressure and I think in a way looking back like being so young actually helped me in a way because I think when you're young you don't really really think about actually the weight of the nation on my shoulders and when you're young in a way you're a bit naive to it all for me like yeah, I was just going in thinking this is just a normal competition. This is just me swimming at my local gala, you know, that type of thing. And that's what I was trying to process it like. But I think London well, did create that extra pressure. But I think without that support team around me, like, I don't think I could have done it as well. Like, yes, I had been age on my side, having the age on my side, but also the factor of having an amazing team around me, my coach, Billy Pye, training with Paralympians. There was a big group of us, there was about 12 of us going in the centre at the time, going into 2012. So all of us having that same mind mindset really, really helps. And then also working with um, a psychologist and like even like my parents as well, just really helping to put into perspective that, yes, it's, it's the Paralympics. Yes, it's the home games, but actually it is just swimming. And I think I wish in sometimes like in later on life, especially the likes of Rio and Togo, I had that mindset again, because yeah. sometimes I think you can forget that it is just sport and it is just swimming. And it's like the weight of your shoulders. Yes, is on the on you from the whole nation. But actually, like, yeah, it's just the sport. Yeah. So actually your young age and your innocence were on your side back in London. Yeah, yeah, I think it was. Yes, definitely. And yeah. And I think, like I said, I couldn't have done it without the support of my friends, family, teammates, and yeah. my parents and my coach and that whole support system that's involved with Paralympics and British swimming. Mm. And I, I remember from London as well, I think it was Channel 4 did the Meet the Superhumans initiative. Mm-hmm. And what they did for the Paralympic movement, I agree with you, was unbelievable. It just brought it into the forefront of, of the nation, really, didn't they? People that never would have watched the Paralympics suddenly were watching 
you know, Ellie Simmons and were fully, fully engaged with, with you guys winning medals. And it was just, it was amazing. Oh, no, I love that Channel 4 advert. I remember, like, so we watched the Olympics and were so excited seeing, like, like Super Saturday and, like, Greg and Mo and then all the others, like Max Whitlock and all of that. And then, yeah, thinking that's going to be us in a couple of months. Well, in a couple of weeks, sorry. But then again, guess again, seeing that Channel 4 advert everywhere saying thanks for the warm-up. It was like, yeah, it was just created a buzz for the Paralympics. And again, even the likes of, like, the last leg, that's still going now. Mm. Even it was 11 years ago. That's on mainstream TV. And it's um, uh, two, uh, two individuals with a disability. Yeah fronting a, a show on Channel 4. And yeah, that progressed again from from the Paralympics back in, in 2012. And again, like the, us, the Paralympians, but also disability in society as well was, I think it helped create change in that. There's mm. lots more to do still, even with 2023, with the accept, acceptance of disability in society, but it was still a turning point back in 2012. Oh, absolutely. And then... If we move forward to the Rio Games in 2016, where you got another gold medal and another world record, I'm going to ask you, did you ever fail? And if so, how did you deal with failure amongst all of your success? Yeah, actually, um, I have. And I think looking back now, I think as an athlete and a woman and a person, actually, when those races that I didn't come first like I remember actually the first time that I ever got beaten was in 2015 at the world championships in Glasgow going in as favorite in the 400 free and a Ukrainian Mareshko came out the out the woodwork out the scene and beat me in the 400 free and it it affected me quite badly actually because again it was the first time getting beat you know and I think it's hard to take as an athlete when you're on that winning streak and then all of a sudden a new person comes on the block like it's tough and I'm very very competitive and when things don't go right I do beat myself up a lot but actually like I said looking back now the times that didn't go well like that that 2015 world championships other races that I've lost in the past or haven't done the best in which I hoped or best the best in my ability I actually learned more from them about myself because when you achieve when you go personal best or get gold medals or whatever you do um that you you're happy with you're always thinking of the next thing you know you're like you go to your medal ceremony and then you go to back to the village and you're you're buzzing you're so excited and then you're like wow like where actually those events that I didn't do well in, I remember sitting down with my coach and the biomechanists, so they're the individuals who video our races and uh, analyse everything. I remember sitting down and I would look back at everything and look, also look back in training, look back in my diary and think, was it a session that didn't go right? Like, was it a skill in my race? Was it a bit of my stroke? What actually went wrong? So then the next day, or when I would go back into training after that competition, I would really, really nail those those bits that didn't go well. So actually moving forward, I, I learned more about myself because I was like, this is what I need to do. And I think we're humans at the end of the day. We can't always be rainbows and butterflies and stuff and gold, gold, gold all the time. Like sometimes, yeah, things don't go right. And actually sometimes, even though we do look and analyze everything, sometimes it just the body just doesn't want to do anything you know like we're human we're not robots yeah I just wish that we knew when we failed that it was going to be beneficial but it's so hard to process that at the time isn't it when you're going through failure the hardest thing is if someone says to you oh that that you'll see that as positive one day (laughs) yeah it's tough and I think like when you're raw from it definitely like I'm quite an emotional person so after a race and an event doesn't go well or a race doesn't go well I'm always like just give me leave me be for a bit like just let me process be emotional or whatever I want to do just have a bit of me time and then but yeah if someone when someone comes up to you and goes like you'll learn from it it's just at that freshness at that time you're like no 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 yeah. you know you're so in the zone. you say like in your your little cocoon but then like you say when when you look back at it in like a week or a month's time you're like yeah it mm. did you know it taught me a thing or two about myself yeah and then you retired from swimming after Tokyo didn't you in September 2021 And usually it's quite a tricky transition to go from being a full-time athlete to retiring from sport. How did you find that transition and how are you still finding it? 
Um, well, to be honest, like I knew going into Tokyo that that was going to be my last game. I'd planned it. Like, even though, yes, it was a year later, like I planned pretty much that it was to retire in 2020. Um, but again, the COVID pa- pandemic came around and changed those plans, not just for me, but for a, a lot of individuals out, out there. We had to adapt and to, yeah, to train, carry on training towards those games. But I planned it that yeah, my last games, full games, I've done everything I wanted. So in a way, that helped because it was on my own two will. You know, there was no forcement, there was no injury and was a factor. It was like, yes, I decided that Tokyo was going to go out there, race, enjoy it and soak in every second. So I think also as well, going into those games, it helped me plan afterwards. Like I had, as soon as I got back from Tokyo, I, I knew that I was fil- starting filming a documentary and sponsor work and TV stuff. So I think that helped create that transition, make it a bit more easier. But I think there's still days, like now it's, it's coming up to two years since retirement. Mm-hmm. And yes, it sounds like a long time, but it's actually quite a short time because I've been swimming from the age of 12, my first world championships to 27 when I retired, like all I've known in my life was swimming. And that's what I did every single day. And we had those plans. We, I knew that I was good at it in a way. Um, whereas now it's like still two years later, I'm like, yes, I'm getting these incredible, amazing opportunities. And I'm not saying anything negative about that, but still it's like, actually, what do I want to do? Like, what am I good at? Like, it's really nice that I guess I wake up and every day is different. I'm trying so many different things, but it's still, I think you you lose in a sense, a bit of your identity. You've lost a part of you because yes, I'm known as Ellie Simmons, the swimmer, but actually I'm not the swimmer now. And it's, yeah, I think, I feel like sometimes it's like an emotional roller coaster. Some days I'm like, this is so nice. I can do anything I want to do. But then some days I'm like, waking up I'm like what actually is it that I want to do but I think gradually it'll take time and not to force it not to rush it and again just what I'm saying to myself is yes just try all these different opportunities because soon I'll realize little things that I don't like doing and then that'll help yeah show me in a way the path that I want to go down yeah so do you know what you want to do yet are you still trying to work Um, that out still trying to like I love documentary making really really enjoy that um and again, I love working with children and individuals with different disabilities. And I love traveling and I'm very passionate about conservation. So if you can, if there's a job title <laughs> or a job that fits all those four, then that'll be me. You know, I'll be happy as Larry all the way. But I think, yeah, I think it's hard at the moment just to find out that everything that covers that. But at the moment, yeah, I'm doing lots of different things and it's it's quite nice still yeah. to, to carry on doing that. Yeah, it's tricky. Like you said, you know, you, you saw yourself, or you think people know you as Ellie Simmons, the swimmer. Mm. And I had David Smith, the Paralympic athlete on here, who said his psychologist told him to stop referring to himself as David Smith, the the athlete. Because when that gets taken away from you, then, then you know, what are you? Um, and he was talking about values and, you know, how so he's taken away that title of David Smith athlete. And actually, you know, he's David Smith and my values are X, Y and Z. And that's really helped him with that transition. And I thought that was a really interesting, an interesting point, because, you know, like you said, you've seen yourself as a swimmer for so many years. That transition must be so difficult. Yeah, yeah, it has been. But again, I think what's been really, really nice that. And again, being an athlete is amazing, but you have to sacrifice a lot. In a way, you have to be quite selfish mm. because you're living and breathing your sport. If you want to be, yeah, be a good athlete or a top athlete, you have to dedicate your life to your sport. So what's been really, really nice since retiring is that I've been able to give in back to, to the people that supported me the most. You know, I've given got yes even things like going to a wedding like my best friend's wedding Mm. going to for a weekend to see my friends you know it's being with my other half you know and seeing family and that type of stuff where in a way that I lost when I was an athlete yes they're always there yes they're supporting you but actually you get to give your time without these distractions and I think that's been really really nice and that's again one of the positives of this new retirement life is and always so people always are like oh my gosh you retired at 27 I'm like yeah I know (laughs) I'm quite young but still like I'm retired (laughs) you know I think they can't take their head around like why are you not still swimming I'm like yes I just I was 
was ready to retire. Yeah. Well, you did four Olympic cycles, which is, you know, unbelievable. Having worked with, with Olympians and Paralympians and seeing the emotion that goes into those four years. <laughs> and you did that four times, you know, where you, you give everything for four years for that one race. I can I can understand why at age 27 you're ready to retire. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you're right, Emma. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, tell us about your Strictly experience. So Strictly Come Dancing. Um, how did you feel going on Strictly? Like, did you know that you could dance? You know, you were born with a achondroplasia, a form of dwarfism. So I wonder, did you have any reservations about how your dances could be adapted or about putting yourself out there for the public to see you? How did you feel about the whole experience? Um, to be honest, I think I felt, I've thought of those types of things more and more when I was getting closer to it. I think, so at the time you, you have your meeting in say like January um, with the execs and then you go for a bit of a trial dance and then they call you up and say, do you want to go on the show? And I was like, yes, definitely. Because I've been a lover of Strictly Come Dancing for years and years and but never would have thought I'd get the opportunity to actually go on it. But then again, like I think, closer to the time I was thinking yeah like how am I going to do these adaptions and so when I was found out I was partnering with Nikita Kuzmin we 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 spoke about it and we chatted and you know, he's never danced with an individual with dwarfism before and I've never danced well did you say that start dancing on like a, a dance floor or a you know on a Saturday night is dancing <laughs> don't think so this was way different you know ballroom and Latin so yeah I've never danced really pretty much unless you do want to do the robot or the shoulder shrug you know that type of thing um but I think what for me what I thought about it closer and closer yes I'm probably going to get a lot of questions you know you're putting yourself out there to a, a massive entertainment show that's watched by 10 million people every Saturday and Sunday night you know you've got to take those, those risks and if I can do something way out of my comfort zone and try something new, then hopefully it'll raise awareness and create this platform. And I guess I was given this um, amazing platform to, to be, represent the dwarfism community and disability community. But if I can do it, then hopefully there's so many people that are like me or in the disability community that can say, yeah, I can do, do that. You know, I can not just dance, but try something new. And again, if I see someone similar to myself on TV, like it, it creates change and positivity. And again, we want to carry on that Paralympic and disability movement and acceptance in society. Having a platform and a show like Strictly Come Dancing gives you that opportunity. Mm, I mean, I, along with the nation, loved watching you on Strictly Come Dancing. I thought, oh, thank you. <laughs> I thought you were absolutely brilliant. Um, and, you know, I know you are a passionate and strong advocate for disability representation. Um, what do you think we as a public could do better when it comes to disability representation? Again, I think the whole treatment of people with a different disability, I think treat them exactly how you do every single person, you know, every human. I think, yes, we might need an extra support, you know, for me going out and about in the streets or going to the supermarket, I may need some extra help, you know, and also like offer the help as well. Don't do it in a patronizing way. Just be like, oh yeah, do you want to help reaching that? You know, that makes such a difference. And again, the language that is used as well, I think that's so, so important because even though, yes, they might have a disability, you know, again, they still want to be spoken to exactly the same as everyone else in society. And again, the amazing platform of TV and representation is so, so powerful. And also the things like adapting um, your workplaces or commutes, you know, think about that because even the likes of just for a disabled person to use the, a disabled toilet, you know, or disabled parking space, just let them, let their lives be a bit easier than what it already has to be. Because a disabled person, even before they walk out the door, they have to plan their routes before, like, compared to an, an, an example of like a non-disabled person, they have to think, is the tube accessible? Is that stop okay? Like, can my wheelchair or can my uh, disability get on this transport? You know, they have to plan ahead. So, so, so to make things, make um, places, make workplaces more accessible and just think ahead. But again, the language and the acceptance is so, so important. Yeah, so growing up with dwarfism, did you feel different? Um. I think I always knew I was different, definitely. 
and I knew growing up again I've got a sister that's got achondroplasia or dwarfism and since a baby I've um, surrounded myself with people of my own identity I've gone to the Dwarf Sports Association and our Restricted Growth Association of UK so growing up I think that helped create I knew that I had identity I saw people who were similar to me and then again being in the, the disability sport world since I was nine years old. I've grown with, up with people of different disabilities. So I think that really, really helps. And also be comfortable with, with who I am. I think, yeah, you get those days where you're like, oh, I wish I wasn't small. You know, you, you see jeans, you see shoes that, again, you want to wear, but you can't because they don't fit. Like I always even now have to, to wear kids' shoes. You know, it's getting better and better. But again, jeans, I always have to alter and I always want to skinny jeans so there's things like that but I think I try and think as positive as I can because if I wasn't the person that I am today or didn't have this disability I wouldn't have got the opportunities that I had I wouldn't have gone to the Paralympics and represented my country but there is days and I think we all as humans don't we in a society where you've got the likes of social media TV you always compare yourself to other people but it's just trying to change that perception where actually if we were all the same it would be such a boring world yeah. and it's great let's celebrate being different with a disability or your different skin color or whoever you love you know we're all the same yeah I love that celebrate being different um but I did I had Will Bailey another Paralympic athlete the table tennis guy on the podcast and he was talking about his experiences of growing up when people used to point at him and laugh for looking different and how that can be quite damaging did do you have any, did, did you have any experiences of that Yeah yeah I think you know we've I think we're human like I keep saying but we're always so intrigued, aren't we, in differences? And like even you sometimes do look at people say they've got bright colour trousers on or they've got different colour hair. You just you are intrigued by it. But I think it's about not just looking, it's about the staring and the pointing. That's the next level. And yeah, I have got it and I still even now being in the again, public eye and the athlete that I am, you still get the stare and you still get the name call. And I think that needs to change, you know, that definitely, it puts a dagger in people's hearts Mm. and stuff. And it definitely, it does affect people and does affect people's confidence. And it's, it's not right. And it needs to change that. Yes, you can have a look, but the next level of staring and name calling is just not right. Yeah. And, you know, you seem on the outside like such a confident, positive person. But I imagine with that kind of name calling and that pointing, that really can kind of chip away at your self-esteem and your self-worth. So how have you managed to stay so positive and so seemingly confident? Um, Yeah, I think there's days, isn't it? Um, There's days where it gets to me more and more. And then there's days where, like, I'm like, come on, Elle, you know, go out there and, like, just try and stand still. Stand tall. It stands tall. That's not even English. Stand <laughs> tall and shoulders up and stuff, and just try to be as confident as I can. But yeah, there is days that not going to lie that it gets to me and it's hard. And you know, you've got to walk out the street, and if you see like a group of teenagers and kids that you're prepared to to get laughed at, and you do have to think about it sometimes. And sometimes I'm like, oh, should I go to the gym because if I'm running up and down, there's going to be people laughing at me. But you know, like I'm just like, if I can do it, if I can try. And be change and like, change the perceptions and try and like see for them to see me like happy and confident then mm. hopefully it will change the perceptions for other people you know yeah. and try and break down those barriers I hope that if anyone's ever laughed at you at the gym you've turned around and said excuse me how many Paralympic medals have you got <laughs> <laughs> yeah no I don't do that but I'm like <laughs> yeah just try and be like oh, all right you know <laughs> and so what advice would you give to any kids out there who might be listening to this, who might also feel a bit different? Again, I think just embrace those differences. I think just, like, just celebrate it. Just be like, yeah, I'm different. Like, isn't this amazing? I'm not the same as, I've not got that, you know, six foot um, brown hair, like, type of stuff. I'm celebrating my differences. And surround yourself with people who love you and support you. And there's some amazing charities out there and some amazing communities that are for people that look 
the same or have got the same disability in there and just to reach out to them because I think having that same identity and having similar being surrounded by people who are similar to creates is is such is so helpful yeah that's great advice and in this podcast I do talk to my guests about their grit and their resilience um and I I wonder do you see yourself as a resilient person um I think as an athlete I definitely think um it's you know, you you have to overcome those challenges. Mm. And again, not just with a disability, but I think age when I was young was hard, you know. Um, I think I'm trying to take that into to, to other life, and um, not other life, but this <laughs> next chapter in yeah. a way. Yeah. Um, so I think there is days when, yes, I'm more resilient and days when it's, yeah, it's, it's harder to be. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, I try to be as much as I can. So do you think growing up with a disability has helped you has helped your resilience has made you have to be a bit more resilient? Yeah, I think it has. I think it definitely has and not just being disabled but being the young age that I was growing up and again being a woman is always another factor too. So I think yes, I think that's all of that has definitely helped and again surrounding myself with people who are resilient and who who can look up to insp- inspire and be mentored by and learn from is definitely an amazing thing yeah I think sport can really help us be more resilient you learn so much from sport that you can then bring into your other parts Mm. of life can't you which I I wish kind of people realized more sometimes they don't realize um, all of those amazing life lessons you get from sport oh yeah Um, yeah and it's not just about um sorry it's not just about again the elite level but grassroots and you can learn so much about yourself from doing any kind of activity and just getting out and moving it's just such an exhilarating thing and again it gives you confidence and like we say resilience and life skills too just going out and doing some some sport whether it's team sport or on your own or or whatever yeah I agree um I wanted to ask you about your documentary that you've got coming out soon am I right that there's a documentary on ITV coming out yeah yes there is so uh, next Thursday oh wow um, soon. it's a documentary that's out on Thursday night um on ITV I think at eight or nine o'clock I should know this by now okay but, but prime um, time eight or nine if you're yeah, if you're on, on the sofa at that time, definitely tune in. But it's a documentary about um, disability and adoption. And I'm delving in and finding out, again, I'm talking very much about disability, but even um, 2022, 2023, which, because the documentary has been a, the, a year in the making, we started it last May and wow. it, we finished wrapping it up in February. But even now in 2022 and 23 children with a disability are seen as harder to place in families Mm. and so I've been investigating why why is this um yes and children not just with a disability but the likes of um children in sibling groups children with a with a different race and who are older also older than seven are seen as harder to place so there's so many factors and that yeah get get them in a way stuck in the care system and not um, not have families and things and yeah why is that barrier in place like is it because again disability people are scared of it there's the unknown money factors and so I've been investigating like why so it's been very fascinating I've met some amazing families and some I've been yeah open had my um the ethics council uh, social workers open their doors for me to follow them for a couple of days and to delve into why as well and see it from their point of view and I've met um people who are adoption um charities and families of who have adopted children with different disabilities so yeah it's just delving into again that disability um life and why is this such a such a factor and seen as a, a negative thing oh that sounds really interesting I will be tuning in to that um and thank I, you um, amongst your documentary making I've also seen on social media it looks like you've been traveling the world and doing things <laughs> with oceans and scuba diving <laughs> and teaching kids swimming maybe in Thailand it just looks like you've got had all of these unbelievable adventures so I wanted to ask you what is next 
Yeah, I've been so lucky this year so far. Like, again, my passion is traveling. And with the love of that, and again, with ocean conservation and working with children, I've been able to go to, to Thailand and teach children and um, how to swim. And then went to Egypt and to Bali and um, Indonesia and working with some really good, cool companies. To, to highlight ocean conservation and wow. worked with um, a company about a coral restoration restoration program and yeah just um working now with Shaw as an ambassador and to get um children with well youths of all different disabilities and who have challenges to to get active and move in and goggle box as well we've just been filming oh, so wow. um I think to be honest what's next is um hopefully the more carry on doing that more and more and to to carry on working on tv and do more documentaries and mm. traveling more and again we've got the paris women world championships in in august well july august working with channel four on that and then okay. next year we've got the olympics and paralympics again so even though i still love to do the travel and the documentary is still to be involved in sport because again that's a massive passion of mine is swimming and that's never going to go away you know and to, to, to raise awareness of not just swimming from grassroots of disability but also mm. that the, the, my teammates as well still still racing away and still competing for the country wow yeah I'm loving watching you evolve from athlete to mm. media genius um, do you um, <laughs> do you have any specific strategies which you have helped which you think have helped drive you forward uh, throughout your athlete career, but also now into your media career? Again, I think that balance. I think there was a point in time, especially the end of last year and the start of this year and in the middle of this year, that I've just been so work-focused that I realised that actually I need to have that balance. And I think sometimes I'm going to put myself to exhaustion where actually it's, I try now to more have like a few days at home at least. Um, because again it's really important to be at home but also be with loved ones and to have that time where it's just you at home you know doing catching up on sleep and just having a bit of you time and going to the gym I find it's really really important you know I noticed when I haven't gone to the gym for a few days that again it really affects me mentally too so having that work-life balance is so so important because again when I was an athlete my coach instilled from me from such a young age to a happy swimmer is a fast swimmer yes. you know so if I'm happy in my life and outside of my work life then it helps resonate into my work life and having that balance of thinking about myself as a person but not just as work 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 now is really important so yeah, yeah giving myself a bit of me time is still is now a massive factor of my my life not just now but going forward yeah I love that a happy swimmer is a fast swimmer because often <laughs> happiness happiness comes up with this question a lot I ask a lot of my guests this question and a lot of them say happiness smiling laughter and I think sometimes we underappreciate the importance of that don't we oh yeah no definitely like just a good laugh you know I think that can release so many endorphins and just let your hair down and be around people that love you for who you are and just a good laugh I don't think we can we can beat at all yeah I agree um the final question I like to ask I like to ask my guests if you could go back in time to when things were at their toughest so maybe you know growing up with some of the difficulties we've talked about what do you wish you could have told yourself as you were going through some of those hard times um so I think going back I think one of my hardest points was going into Rio in 2016 in those Paralympics moved to a high performance center in Manchester and was based there for two years and had an individual on the team well on the coaching team that was coached by who was get yeah, not a nice man um and looking back now um I wish I could stand up for myself more mm -hmm. and stand up for my teammates as well and be a team player because I think yeah at that time we were very much controlled and looking back now I think yeah you could like it's that's definitely a lesson to learn you know but I think at the time when you're controlled by an individual that's very very controlling and puts you down a lot it's it's hard isn't it to, to stand up for yourself but yeah looking back standing up for myself and teammates definitely and using my voice as well yeah I think was a massive part that I should have played yeah and that's why I try and talk about 
again disability and the treatment and everything and the awareness of different disabilities now because definitely learned a lot from those but I think also as well not just from the hard times but looking back now is I wish in a way I didn't wish my life away because I think so much as an athlete and as a human you're always looking for that next thing all the time where actually I wish that like even going from going into London is if I just stopped for like 10 minutes and just soaked it in more and took more photos and like yeah captured those slow moments more and more because I think so like I said so much we're so go 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 all the time and as an athlete you're always looking for those next championships or next way in which to perform better and better actually like just enjoy those moments slow down and soak it in it's about enjoying the now and enjoying the process. Mm. And I think often, especially in sports, people are too driven by the goals, the final goal. Mm. And I think you're right. People forget to enjoy the the here and the now. So, yeah, anyone listening, I really hope that that resonates with them as well. Because I fully agree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, exactly. Definitely. Um, Ellie, thank you so much for coming on When Life Gives You Lemons and sharing your story with us. Um, since retirement, I've loved watching you forge this successful media career. You inspired the nation with your swimming. And honestly, I think that you continue to inspire with everything else that you you are setting out to do. Um, I'm really looking forward to watching your documentary when it comes out. And yeah, thank you so much, Ellie. It's been a great chat. <laughs> Thank you ever so much, Emma, for having me on. It's been yeah, really, really lovely to chat. Thanks, Ellie.